hello, everyone. It's great being here. It's a great honor. Um, I'll pick up the challenge uh, from uh, Mr. Mironov. Yes, how should I talk with you today about this forgotten institution of school and schooling? Um, actually, like some other people behind, I was wondering and I'm still wondering what am I doing here and what is my the link between my field and uh, physics, but since we're already, some of us, putting ourselves these questions, probably that we are not here by accident, we are here by design. So, um, I have to confess that my only link with physics, besides being here today, is that uh, I graduated two years of a high school in uh, mathematics and physics, and here I am talking to you today about pedagogy and education, so you can think yourself how much I followed, uh, as much as Alex did. Um, I strongly believe that uh, new generations of today, more than ever before, they need strong minds. And in order to have those strong minds, to build those strong minds, they need to go through experiences of authentic learning. Talking about authentic learning, this is my invitation for today and uh, checking a little bit how learning could be authentic and how can we address this challenge. Before going into that, I would like to remind you a very well-intentioned statement which is quite very much used in the policy communities. It is very much used by policy makers. And they are saying that in order to solve a problem, first of all, you have to admit it exists. I think that our main challenge in trying to solve the problem of education, we have to admit that the problem exists. Um, we have to admit that we are facing a huge challenge. I would like to remind you today that the quality of education in Romania and the quality of learning, and not only in Romania, and this was said before, is constantly falling down. And I'm not going to use any statistical data to prove that, although some well-respected researchers would say maybe I should. I would just like to remind you that we are scoring below average in all international assessments related to education, not to say that we are scoring quite close to the bottom line in all those assessments. And um, I think that today we have no excuse to that. I mean, it was a period of time in the beginning of those assessments in which we were saying that, you know, we are scoring low because, for instance, the tests are culturally biased. So we were scapegoating the tests. But then, in the recent years, we just had the baccalaureate, right? Well, we cannot blame the baccalaureate that is culturally biased. It was built here. We can say that maybe baccalaureate was video camera biased, but that's another story. Um, for quite some years already, as I said, the quality of education is going down and I think that we have all the reasons to be worried, but we are not here to share our worries. Anyway, we are here to talk a little bit about learning and I think, I really believe that learning is great. I mean, you are all learning, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here in these experiences. But learning was not the same all over the time. You know. If I'm going back a little bit, since I do have the time, if I'm going back a little bit to the early ages of the humankind, when people tried to get influence and to get power, in the early ages, they were trying to find and to stock goods. You know, They were finding and stocking food, they were finding and stocking land, they were finding and stocking gold, and so on. So finding and stocking goods was the way to get the influence. And yes, we had an early age of education as well. Well, not overlapping history with that one, but anyway, we had an early age of education in which some systems are still playing around. It was the early age in which education was very much focused on contents, you know. The early age of education in which, in order to get educated, you should find and stock knowledge. And for generations, people were used, young generations were used, as a vehicles to transfer knowledge from one generation to the other. So finding and stocking more information, it was the meaning of learning. But, you know, step by step, this very approach became obsolete together with the era in which 
so many researchers, so many inventions, so many innovations appeared and the quantity of knowledge at our disposal grew tremendously. We have found earlier from Mr. Mironov that 90% of the scientists ever are still alive, so they are producing this information that sometimes we are still trying to fit into the heads of the young generation, which of course, technically, would not be possible. Anyway, education made a kind of natural move from focusing on this content to another kind of approach, together with the industrial and the managerial approach in the broader society. We started to focus not so much on finding and stocking knowledge, but to ask ourselves the question, what should we do with that knowledge? How, how can we use it in an effective way to impact in the real life? So it became important not what you know, but what you can do with it. How can you use it in an effective way? And in education, we made a step from contents to outcomes. And we call that outcomes in different ways. We call them objectives or standards or competencies and so on. And so, on. so our school started not so much to transport contents, but to try to form competencies, to build competencies uh, and skills. But this second approach that I'm talking about, it also became quite obsolete nowadays for a very simple reason. We have no idea what will be the jobs that the kids will perform when they will finish different kinds of schools and schooling, right? Actually, we have no idea how the world will look like tomorrow, if we are to be honest here. So this approach on focusing of competencies, I think that this was also very, and it is also very much challenged by the very fact that we have no idea what competencies we should train in school that are going to be used tomorrow. Um, so, not the inputs nor the outcomes of the learning process are able to offer us a good understanding of learning itself. I think it's time to give, not to give up, to put under brackets these two approaches and to focus on this black box that we call learning and to really try to understand what does it mean authentic learning? What makes learning authentic if contents and outcomes do not succeed to do it? And I really believe that we need this new understanding of learning and going beyond this activity of focusing on skills and competencies because as Whitehead said some time ago, we are, children are the message that we are sending to a future that we will not see. So we have no idea if in the future those children that we are training today will use or not whatever we are giving them in the schools. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about authentic learning. I think that it's time to try to identify some ingredients of authentic learning, and there are at least three of them. The first ingredient of authentic learning, I think, is disposition. Disposition for learning. In order to learn, you need a specific disposition. You need a habit of mind, a state of mind that would allow you to make sense of your experiences, either academic or non-academic, in order to grow and to develop. Disposition for learning means at least three things. It means readiness for learning, it means willingness for learning, and capability for learning. What does it mean to be ready to learn? To be ready to learn, it means to have a calm mind, to have a relaxed mind. You wouldn't be able to learn if you would be in a miserable state, don't you? I mean, you wouldn't be able to learn when you are nervous, um, where you are stressed, where you have headache or heartache, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? So the first condition for having a disposition for learning, it is to have a calm, a relaxed mind. Well, this would not suffice, as you can imagine. And then it's about willingness to learn. What is this willingness to learn? Willingness to learn, it is curiosity. It is given by curiosity. It is given by critical inquiry. It is given, as Pascal said it once, about doubt, uh, about determination to cross the lines, as it was mentioned in two of the previous speeches, to be determined to cross the line. And if you have the mental disposition, the readiness to learn, and the willingness to learn, then you have to be able to learn. What does it mean to be able to learn? 
beyond any kind of technical explanation to that, being able to learn means persisting when it's difficult, not giving up. That's being able to learn. And I have here a very recent example that I got from one of my students in the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences. I teach a course on policy analysis in one of our masters, and there I have a student from Syria, by the way. And this student had to prepare, like others, for the final exam, a policy brief and to defend it, a policy brief on education. And the idea of his policy brief, very much related to this persisting when it's difficult, it was like this. Okay, you all know what is the situation in Syria. It's a horrible conflict there, he said, and more than 70,000 people already died. But what he was saying, he was saying something like this. Regardless what kind of conflict would have, we have, both parties involved in the conflict should work together to preserve education. Because regardless who is winning, they will both need schools, learning, and education. And I think that was a very simple but brilliant idea that he came up into the discussion illustrating this ingredient of authentic learning, being able to learn as persisting when it's difficult. Um, authentic learning, in the second place, it's a matter of understanding. Understanding the context, understanding the practice of the discipline, understanding the biographies of those who are coming into a learning experience because Learners are not coming in a learning experience empty. They are coming with the whole world. And that whole world should relate with the discipline and should relate with the context in which what they are learning is going to be used. Well, you know, when facing new learning, new knowledge, we can have three approaches to that. We can look at the new knowledge as facts, as disparate items that, you know, using our symbolic memory, we can internalize and then we can reproduce it if it is asked. Well, on another side, we can look at the new learning, at the new knowledge as tools. We can have a pragmatic approach and think about how we can use what we learn, how we can make use of this in the real practice, how we can change our life with this, and here we use our syntactic memory, which allows us to internalize procedures, to internalize processes. Well, and the third approach, a more deeper approach, would be to look at the new learning, to look at the new knowledge in terms of meanings, in terms of understanding and interpretation of the facts beyond the lines. Here we are using a third type. We are using our semantic memory, which allows to go beyond surface. Yes. So in order to have authentic learning experiences, we need a disposition, we need a focus on understanding, and Last but not least, authentic learning means creating authentic learning scenarios. Involving learners in the learning process with all the dimensions they have, not only with the cognitive one, but in the same time with the emotional one, with the social one, and with the actional one. You know, learners don't want to think and that's it. They would like to share, they would like to feel, and they would like to do, to act. So, in an authentic learning environment, I would say, the learners cannot let knowledge to get inert. Or to use a very recent metaphor, to be dormant. Knowledge is alive. You know that this metaphor with being dormant, it was recently used by Ken Robinson in one of his new releases on education. He was doing that in Edinburgh a few weeks ago, and here I am in Magurele doing my bit on uh, education. Um, anyway, getting back to authentic learning scenarios, I believe that this is the most important competence of the professional educators, to be capable to design authentic learning scenarios. And in order to illustrate that, I have a small quote with me, and I will share it with you. It is from Casals, who says this, each moment never was before and will never be again. And yet, what we teach children in school is that two plus two, it's four. And that, you know, Paris is the capital of France. What we should be teaching them is what they are. We should be saying, do you know what you are? You are a marvel, you are unique. In all the world, 
there is no other child like you. In the millions of years that have passed, it was another child, it was not another child like you. You may become a Shakespeare, a Michelangelo, or a Beethoven. You have the capacity for anything. Yes, you are a marvel. And here, my message to you is, let's try to support our children to become the marvels they are, because otherwise we may die of a heart attack. Thank you very much.